Welcome back to my guide tutorial to uh, Battle Brothers. Uh, and today we're going to start with a little snippet excerpt from the Battle Brothers wiki page. Maybe you haven't been there, it's got all the information you could ever uh, hope to find regarding the, the inner workings of the game. But I've cherry picked from the giant chart um, that shows all the different character backgrounds and how they affect the stat roles that those characters can have. And Battle Brothers does a pretty good job of making things, I mean, as realistic as, as you would kind of expect in this regard. Um, so if you you expect, if you look on here, the farmer, okay, the farmer is working outside all day, so it's going to make him physically strong. He has a very high health rating and a very high fatigue rating compared to some of his peers. So this shows the minimum and the maximum range that a farmer will have for these. Uh, the farmer does not have to fight much. He doesn't, you know, he's out there farming all the time. So his, his nerve is not very high, his resolve, uh, because he's not forced to, to fight. Uh, it also means his weapon skill. I mean, if you look, 47 to 57 is kind of the default for normal non-combatant jobs same with archery range attack 32 to 42 for the most part is kind of average uh, melee defense pretty low range defense pretty typical because again he's not a fighter but you can compare it to someone like a butcher okay the butcher is not as physically active so the butcher doesn't have as high health he's not as physically active so he doesn't have the same fatigue uh, he chops up bodies I suppose is the rationale. He's used to the sight of blood, so he is not as uh, skittish as the farmer is, so his resolve is higher. It's kind of interesting, but he gets a slight, slight, you know, three points to the minimum, two points to the maximum weapon skill, and I assume it's because he's actually swinging a, a cleaver, a weapon, all day, but everything else is pretty much the same. Um, one that's interesting is the brawler, a lot of people assume he can have a much better weapon skill as well because he's a fighter, right? Um, his health, which is kind of reflected of his your physical strength, is higher, not as high as the farmer's, but higher than average because he's he has to work out the fight. His fatigue is higher than average, but it's not, again, as high as the farmer's, not great. Because he does fight, his resolve is slightly higher. In fact, quite a bit higher than the farmers because he's used to fighting. Um, but his weapon skill, eh, I mean, it's it's better than the farmers, but he's not fighting with weapons, really. It's unarmed combat. So while he has a slight bump, it's in fact, the max is only 57 compared to the butchers. Uh, it's not, it's nothing amazing. And his defensive skills are, again, just average, normal. And you can see at the top... Uh, again, when I talk about looking for people to hire, militiamen and manhunters in some ways are kind of your highest potential troops. Even the lumberjack to some degree. I think of the lumberjack as almost like a super farmer. He's almost as healthy, almost the same fatigue, but he starts with usually a much higher resolve, which is very helpful. Uh, and he has a slight boost to, not the maximum, but at least a slight boost to the minimum rollability for weapon skill. Again, because I assume because he's swinging an axe all day. So he's a little bit more expensive, and he's also usually a little more expensive to hire, because when you hire one, he probably has an axe, and those are pretty expensive weapons. Um, but if you look at the militiamen and the manhunter, uh, they have 62, the highest potential weapon skill, and 2 to 7 for defensive, melee defensive skills, which is better than almost everybody. The only one who's potentially better there is the thief, who um, has some average weapon skill. But if you want to make someone who's very defensive, potentially, this is a bit of a gamble, because he doesn't have the greatest health and fatigue, but he starts with very high defensive stats, and he starts with very high initiative. And if you want to give someone the dodge perk, or nimble and put them in lighter armor and try to work that build, uh, the thief is potentially where you want to go with that. So you can see, um, while these guys don't have the highest physical stats, their physical stats are good, they have higher resolve, and they have good fighting stats. So um, 
Now you can look down here at the bottom just for comparison. These are things you can't recruit. I don't actually think you can recruit cultists either. I probably shouldn't have thrown them on here. But um, in the other ones where you don't have to hire just peasants and lowborn, uh, here are some other backgrounds. And in some ways, these guys aren't aren't sign aren't hugely better. I mean, physical stats, fatigue, and health are pretty much the same. The hedge knight has a lot more strength, but he's actually more comparable to the farmer in some regards. Um, you'll notice there's, there is a bit of a difference here. All of them have on the higher range of resolve. And in fact, a couple of these guys have very high resolve. You don't have to worry about it at all. It's, it's automatically going to be at a, at a pretty good level. But even their weapon handling skills, I mean, the hedge knight, who's one of the best guys you can get overall long term, 58 to 67. Okay, you're looking at plus five over the militiamen, right? But realistically, five, an average of five is one and a half uh, level ups, assuming you have stars in the category. So, I mean, that's, well, it doesn't sound like a lot. One and a half to two level ups is a significant advantage. And when it's across the board and everything, he has slightly higher resolve, slightly higher fatigue, slightly higher, well, much higher health. Uh, six to ten defense instead of two to seven. So every one of these is is one or two level ups above the highest of the lowborn ranks, and that stuff adds up over time. Now, of course, you're paying three and a half times as much, but um, you can see where these start multiplying and making these guys better. And you'll see the same thing in the next one here looking at your ranged options, the lowborn options. For ranged, I keep talking poacher because the poacher is the safest bet when you're hiring someone. Now, if you look, the bowyer, he actually has a potential to be 52, to be a higher, um, a higher range skill than the poacher, but his low is 42. So there's a lot less consistently consistency when you're hiring this guy. And if you look at some of his other stats, he's got the same health, but on average, he's not doesn't have the same fatigue. He potentially has slightly lower resolve. Um, so it's a safer bet to go with the poacher. The shepherd could potentially have the same maximum, but again, the the range is much lower when it comes to where it can be. So it's not as consistent. He does have better consistency with resolve, probably because he's a shepherd, he's by himself defending a flock against wolves or something, I don't know what the rationale is, but that's what I'm guessing. And realistically, the militiaman, his range skill can get pretty high if it happens to roll, but again, it's a much wider spread. He does have better resolve and some other skills, but you shouldn't be hiring militiamen hoping for a a good ranged person. You may stumble across one, but that's not, this is your consistent purchase looking for a ranged option. And just again, for comparison, if you're playing where you have any kind of options, um, you're going to be hiring hunters every time. And if you look at what the hunter brings, better fatigue, better overall average resolve, um, Weapon skill, actually, for some reason, is slightly bit lower, but, but it doesn't matter. So you're hiring him for. His minimum is one level up above the maximum <laughs> of a poacher and potentially much higher. And he even has better range defense to boot. So uh, this guy wins every time. Again, he's two and a half times as expensive, uh, but he's worth every penny of it. And looking at the last little bit I've been playing, let's just we can look now at some examples. So when you hire somebody, you're paying for their stat line, their ability, their perks. Um, not their perks necessarily, but I mean, if you're hiring a cripple or you're hiring a squire, um, even if they were both equipped with nothing, the squire is going to cost more because he's, in general, a better person uh, for a battle brother. But you're also paying for their equipment. So after you've played for a while, you should start getting an eye for when there's a deal. Uh, militiamen oftentimes are like 800 to 1,000 gold because they come with a lot of gear. And when you buy gear, it's it's pretty expensive. And so it's kind of put you in a catch-22. If they're, if you don't have a lot of money, 
um, you can't aff- you're looking to hire people you well you can't afford to spend money on a guy with a bunch of gear and if you've got money you've probably got decent gear and you don't want to spend extra to buy a guy with his own gear when you've probably got some already in your inventory so like this guy he's only 460 so that's actually a pretty good price for a militiaman because he's got crap gear instead of much more expensive stuff that you normally see them with a couple poachers as well i think i hired one of them and boom so we got this hated brand guy 490 but right away you can see he's got asthma which uh, i was having a hard time getting it to screen capture with the pop-up windows but it's negative three fatigue recovery per turn i think every turn you recover six or eight i don't know ten you recover a certain amount of, of fatigue every turn and this takes three of that away that this guy is garbage he can never be a great person so even though i spent 500 gold on this guy i have to i have to fire him immediately because again anytime he goes into a fight if he dies he potentially scares my other brothers and if he which makes the fight more dangerous for them and if he survives he's just taking experience away from the guys who actually can be useful and slowing down their progress so it sucks but you've got to just fire him right off the bat and be done with it. Here's another guy. Farmer. Um, you know, average melee, but two stars. Average defense, but two stars. And as you can see with farmers, as we saw from the first slide, good health, good fatigue. Even though it doesn't have stars in it, it's way above normal people's starting stats. And you're going to level up these quickly anyway doesn't have high resolve um, but everything else is strong enough you might still consider keeping this guy especially the, the low resolve is a problem when at the very beginning especially when you don't have a lot of armor your guys are gonna get hit and they'll very quickly panic these guys are already a couple levels in they've got better armor uh, so they're not gonna panic as quickly he's gonna get decent armor to at least absorb a shot or two so I'm less concerned now about someone panicking immediately. And, you know, after a couple of turns, you can upgrade this, uh, if you roll well, up to four points at a time. So just a couple level ups, and he could be into a range where I'm not so worried about him panicking immediately. Not high enough skill to be a, a dedicated two-handed fighter guy, but solid stats to be a, a very good dude. Just a, a shield, weapon, and heavy armor just utility guy in the front line now kind of talking stats and things this is another farmer it's an interesting one to keep in mind this comes up occasionally and if you're not careful it can waste a level up so this farmer has this perk which gives you plus 10 to your resolve so you can see it down here on his stat sheet it shows his resolve is 39 right he's leveling up and it says I can put three points into his resolve, and his resolve is 29. When you level up and it shows your stats, it is showing the character's absolute baseline stats. It doesn't include the plus 10 from this already. So you may see this if you're not paying attention, you don't remember, you don't look. You might think, oh man, this guy's is, this resolve is really low. Uh, I better put a couple of points into it to bump him up. When in reality, he's actually at 39 which makes a significant difference in your calculus of where to assign points. There's only a couple stats that do stuff like that. It's usually not a big deal, but resolve especially uh, can catch you with that. So pay attention to it. Uh, we talked about the militiamen earlier. Um, it's a good example, too, of how things can change if you're not... Uh, you know, I hired a manhunter, finally, expecting a good militiaman you know type fighter or at least hoping for that instead i've got a guy with three stars and a mediocre ranged attack skill um so you would think well i'm not i wasn't looking for a ranged guy and 40 isn't very high so i could just fire this guy i could not have stats he doesn't have stars and any stats to be a good sword and shield dude but 
with three stars and it's uh, this is again kind of going deep into the knowledge of the game but someone with three stars in range attack should get about 10 extra ranged points over somebody with one star in range skill and i've got a poacher who started at like 47 or 48 with one star this guy even though he's only at 40 with three stars in here by the time he reaches maximum level he will actually have more range skill than my poacher who started with one star and 47 or 48 skill not by a lot but he'll get there um, so he's actually probably worth keeping just as a another ranged attack person um, a little expensive because i gotta pay for him and a manhunter i think is more expensive than a poacher but um you have to make compromises instead of just firing this guy who costs a decent amount of money um, he at least has enough skill to be a an effective ranged person so we can keep this guy and the final thing i'll mention is when you're looking at your at people to hire these I don't know, titles, descriptors, the drunk, the snake, they actually do mean something. Um, so if you hire this guy, he probably is a drunk. And that one in particular has a very specific stat uh, effect. You know, it gives you, I think, plus 10% damage, uh, plus 5 resolve, but negative 5 weapon skill and negative 10 range skill or something. Um, and some of them, like I might say the bull or the stallion, those may indicate multiple different perks that could be available, uh, but all of them are going to be Colossus or Brute, something about being large and strong. Uh, or the Dwarf, the guy is going to be short-statured with higher defensive stats but lower melee damage. So these do matter. Again, the Battle Brothers wiki has the entire list if you want to look and see what it potentially means. But even if you want to try to play more... Um, I guess realistic or in character um, just know that if says the snake maybe he's fast or difficult to hit um, this guy is a drunk which means he there's a drunk perk or maybe he's got the irrational perk maybe uh, you know his his resolve checks are plus and minus randomly uh, that might be the mad as well if it says he's crazy so Keep that in mind. It does make a difference. And some of them are good perks and some of them are not so good. So, <clears throat> since my party was getting higher higher level, I'll say. Not only characters getting higher level, but better gear, better equipment. They can start taking tougher quests. Um, I was offered a quest to go track down the bandit hideout, which is one of the more difficult ones potentially. It's got two skulls, which is supposed to indicate the difficulty, but the payment amount is kind of low compared to what I've expected for other quests. And I found it seems that if the payment, the payment sometimes seems to have an impact on the difficulty of the quest as well. So uh, I was at least intrigued enough to take this quest, assuming I could go to the location, check it out. If it's too hard, I could leave. And quit the quest and if it's not too difficult i can complete it now because there's a good chance i may decide to bail out when it says it wants crowns in advance you have to say i want payment wants more payment when the work is done and hopefully the advance goes away the final amount goes up so if you again decide to bail on the contract you don't take as large a hit with the uh, relationship with this town and again, pop-ups weren't recording properly, but when I went over here, sure enough, there's only like six thugs inside there, which is a pretty easy fight for my party. Now, it could be a couple things. It could be this location spawned that way and only had a few thugs, and it was an easy quest. Um, but if you actually watch these bandit layers and other locations, I mean, they will randomly, they'll have a garrison assigned. They'll randomly generate raiding parties. The party will go out it'll attack a few caravans or whatever and then it will come back and when it generates that raiding party to go out the garrison is weakened and then when the party comes back the garrison is increased again so i could have just uh, been fortuitous and stumbled across it after they'd recently sent out a raiding party and they were just in a weakened state theoretically if it was very high level and too tough 
I could camp out and watch it and wait to see the raiding party leave, but that, that could take a couple days, and that's usually not worth it because, again, every if you're sitting there for several days, you're just burning money waiting for something to happen. And maybe the party's already out, and it's just too strong for you to begin with. So just keep that in mind. There's a couple useful little tips to keep a, an eye out for. Um, I got the quest, again, the quest I say is normally one of the best ones to take. Track, track down the stolen item. So you track down the item, and sure enough, it's seven thugs, even though I'm at... Um, you know, a, a place where that's a pretty easy fight for me. I'm more advanced than that. These track the item quests are usually under difficulty, so they're nice and easy ones to knock out. And this is even better if it's thugs. I've got seven dudes. I've got pole arms. I've got a ranged guy with a bow. They're not fleeing, so I think it's at least a, a fight worth staying to engage in, which is great. Because fighting in the forest means their movement is restricted. They're slowed down. There's choke points where my pole arms, and we can just gank up on them. So it's great. So we can go in there and take them out. Except occasionally, the thugs are selling the item that they've stolen to a necromancer. And that makes this battle ten times more difficult, and suddenly I'm at a disadvantage especially because it's in the forest because there's a necromancer in the back who's going to continue to raise the bandits you kill back as zombies uh, and now he's raised them from the dead he can empower them to be more difficult to fight um, and the only way you can stop him is either with a really good archer you shoot him to death or you have someone run him down but now all the obstacles in the way the forest floor being more difficult and taking longer to travel through uh, now it puts me at a disadvantage now the good thing is you can fall back you don't have to actually go into the fight right away you can see that there's a necromancer and then you can make the determination whether you want to fight right away you want to fall back and drop the quest or you want to fall back and maybe again re-equip your people ideally as the game progresses your inventory should be a third full of just different types of weapons because different opponents will be easier to tackle with different weapons and if you don't like fighting veter gangers and zombies um, have a bunch of scramasacks and cleaver type weapons and you can just behead them and the necromancer can't resurrect them once they've been beheaded or potentially if you fall back Sometimes the opponents will run and leave, and you can follow them. And once they get out of the forest and into the open, it's a much easier fight now because now you can have someone flank around and try to run down that necromancer. And as long as you get in base contact with him, he can't resurrect people, and then the fight becomes much, much easier. Um, but in this case, they weren't running. And again, I don't want to sit and wait. And I think my party is strong enough to win this without... Uh, hopefully without anyone getting killed. It's, it's going to be a tough fight, but I think we can deal with it. So actually, I recorded that fight because there's some tactical stuff involved when fighting this kind of thing. So let's watch that. So I figured actually watching the fight with the bandits and the necromancer would be something relatively interesting. There's a lot of strategy involved, and it's a little, little unusual. So let's first again, you're going to put on to see where the obstacles are and it makes it a lot easier and you want to keep the trees off so uh, like I think we did on the uh, maybe the first battle with some thugs one of the earlier ones just kind of get an idea of what your opponents are cleaver mediocre although again I haven't I keep forgetting to equip I think I have one bandage and I probably should put it on somebody but it's a it's a weak weapon my frontline guys all have decent armor now so I'm not too concerned about getting a lot of damage done stick and no armor that guy's worthless uh, stick stick so this is great I, the only one with any weapon that's of, da of, of a danger to me would be this guy and he's not very well armored and of course he's got no shield so he should be easy to pick apart and I've got an actual ranged weapon now so depending on who's in front I can shoot him up now if you look at the battlefield these guys are going to come through here and ideally, we can put one, two, three people. So it's three against two. And one of our guys will have the high ground. These two will probably come around through here. 
Uh, so I could, I could have maybe two guys, maybe one steps up here. This guy stays behind him and they stop him. The next big issue is going to pop up though is as soon as I start killing people, the necromancer back here is going to start resurrecting them as zombies. And so I'm going to have, after I kill somebody and make a hole, somebody's going to have to run through and get to the necromancer or he's going to keep doing it and just raising them every turn. And eventually my guys will get fatigued. Um, the other thing I could do is put three people here, have my fourth person here, and then just kind of bunker up here. Let the, they can step there. They won't hit anything. They'll have to come back down. Uh, I think I may actually take this terrain, though. Hopefully, if it's just these two, they'll come through. I'll kill them, and then these two can start going off to hunt. And if we kill enough here, they can move in. The other thing is, once you kill a guy, let's say I've got my line of three here, and we kill the guy who's here. This guy can step forward and pick the weapon up off, pick the weapon up off the ground. If you come down to this, anything that's on the ground, you can pick up if you get action points. So you can step forward, you can pick it up. The guy may still be risen as a zombie, but if you have his weapon, he won't rise up with it, and then he's just unarmed biting you, which doesn't do very much damage. So um, that's one way. Before this battle, I actually, like you, I think I showed in the slide earlier, you can just, with no penalty, just step back and away from the fight. So I did. I thought I had a cleaver, which again lets you behead people. Um, a couple episodes ago, I accidentally sold something in a shop, just right-clicked on it, and that must have been what it was. It was a scramus axe, actually, which is a good weapon, uh, which would have been handy to chop off heads. I would have given it to the guy up here on the hill. That way, he's got a bonus to hit, so he's not doing a big fatigue-inducing swing and missing very much. But we'll make do with what we've got. So I'll pause. I'll pause. Step up. Step up. A nice line. It'll give us a huge advantage in the fight. This guy has a flail, and his opponents are either no helmet or basically no helmet. So now their gear isn't that great, but I still might just headshot him because it will be quicker. And the quicker I can kill things, the quicker I can start hunting for the necromancer. This guy, eh, and you know, a hatchet is a, a as far as beginner level weapons, hatchet, axes in general are decent weapons, and he's got a real shield, so and a decent helmet. I mean, this is actually one of the. I mean, these guys are all terrible, so <laughs> there's not a lot of competition. But he's one of the better ones here. Um, I could step forward and quick fire. I think I'll just do an actual shot instead. Wounding is always nice. I could shield wall, but I don't care. Oh, actually, stepping on these normal terrain only takes two uh, AP. This forest floor takes three AP, so they can't step forward twice and hit me. So I don't have to block. Ooh, they do have a reach weapon, though. Okay. Uh, so we'll just headshot this guy. So his helmet, you can see, even though his helmet was probably... 20 health it it saved him from getting a huge amount of damage it still didn't save his life well it probably did <laughs> it just took two shots instead of one and he'll step back and there he okay so it is nice at least that he gets revealed when he does that and he doesn't have a weapon anymore which is great i don't know where it went but Now, I could step forward and shoot. I don't think I need to. Uh, instead, I think I might shoot this guy. That's good. Uh, we'll wait. If this pol polearm guy moves up a couple steps, maybe I can quick shot at him, too. Uh, this might be a second turn, actually. So... He... Has a backup weapon. I'm just worried that thing may come back to life as a skeleton or a zombie next. So let's move up one. We'll finish that guy, hopefully. And pick apart that guy. Yeah, that will actually be a problem, potentially. 
we would have finished people off. I mean, it would be nice to hit this guy and take his armor so that the other weapons work, but if we can kill them quickly, he can only resurrect eh, one, maybe two a turn. I can't remember for sure. It might be two, actually. But if we can kill these guys quickly enough, we can start rolling forward to actually finish the Necromancer off. And he won't be able to, to cast his spell as long as someone's next to him and touching him. We don't have to kill him. Uh, I kind of want to shoot that guy, but he's got cover. Neck, uh, those guys are a pain. He does have his stick still, which is annoying. He could actually step forward. He might need some help down there. Yeah, you can see we're already running. In fact, I do... This part of me wants him to just run away so he won't get resurrected and I can go hunting, but I kind of want his stuff, so... Uh, we'll see what we can do. Now, he'll just move forward and stop when they run, because he hasn't gone yet, he hasn't gone yet. So they'll both run, he'll get to hit them for free, and then hopefully they're either dead, or then I can move forward and uh, get closer to the Necromancer. So he's going to wait. Uh, he will swing, step forward. That's not good. That's the other thing. If I don't have any dead bodies nearby, the Necromancer can supercharge one. No, they've only got sticks, but still not what I want. Well, we got one of them. <laughs> Even supercharged, he's not doing very much damage. Of course, I can't hit the thing, which is not good. All right, let's see what's here. There's a stick on the ground. We'll pick that up. I can't move again, unfortunately. Now, thankfully, this guy is swinging and trying to hit him. The fact he's on the hill and has a shield is keeping him alive, but uh, it's not going to last forever. That guy is actually pretty dangerous. I have to uh, do something about it. Let's see what he sees. Uh, there's the big axe on the ground. I don't want a zombie coming back with that, so I'll pick it up. Hopefully we can get through this way. If we have to go through here, I'm going to be displeased. Uh, I don't have quick hands, but I can at least stab him. And he raised one, and he supercharged the chump. <laughs> uh, he's going to wait, and maybe next turn shield block. Just try to keep him getting killed by that guy. Now, I could step down and try to swing. Uh, I think I'll wait. Hopefully, I'll get to go first and do it. Uh, I'd rather, I don't want to step down here and then have him get to go first next round. So, And he's already injured slightly, so I'll do that. Do that. Finish up. Um, yeah, I have to. He's not hitting anything, is he? Got to finish that guy off. Oh, he rallied. A cumbersome fight. Always appreciate that. I can't hit despite having very good odds. 70s to hit. Oh, fuck you. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> well, oh, sure, now the guy's running. Well, that should happen sometimes, I guess. Man, you can see we're starting to get fatigued. I kill that guy. Oh, he picks up the stuff from the dead guy. That's not good either. Or is that actually my guy? No, it's just a thug. Doesn't look blocked, not yet at least. 
this guy is actually going to threaten me quite a bit because I'm going to have a hard time hitting him. to just gank him now, which is, again, not ideal, but it's the best we got. <laughs> Alright, so at least we're not going to get any more. Now the big question is, can Kurt actually beat this guy in combat? These necromancers uh, are better than thugs. <laughs> They're not great, but again, my guys aren't super great either. And it's just the one dude. Let's come up here. Uh, again, now we should start trying to just team up on people since the Necromancer can't res them anymore. I'm getting too tired. Let's uh, up to there. Finish him. Uh, I don't need to pay for the front line. Ugh, see, he just got wrecked. I don't know if we can actually kill a Necromancer. Now, if we get these pole arms into distance, we can maybe kill this guy. The good thing is Necromancer is usually only swing once, so he's not attacking super frequently, but now he's got my guy bleeding, which isn't good. Ah, uh, we've injured him. He goes in two turns. I could I could run him through to give these guys a boost, a hit of five points, because he's closer. But if he steps through, who's next? Him. Uh, I don't want to risk him getting hit with that axe, so he's just going to wait. <laughs> he got hit again, which means he's going to keep bleeding. Ah, unless he finishes the fight. So, bad news. I lost a dude. And you can see I actually put their, this is what I usually do, I kind of forgot. So I usually put their title there, so when it's time to level them up, uh, it's a little clearer. And sometimes I may have, it may, I don't see it in here, but it may say like two-handed, maybe the question mark, like, hey, if this guy rolls really well, I'm going to make him a two-handed guy. And then later on as it evolves, it's like, oh, he's rolling kind of low on his, his uh, weapon skills, so we'll just make him a dude instead and I'll switch it. But... Levels up all around. Lost a guy, but yeah, that's going to happen sometimes. Uh, got his armor back and his shield, it looks like, but probably not his helmet, which is annoying because I just bought one, but that happens. All right, so there's that. At least we got paid. So once again, our interesting little point came up I thought would be of interest. So I've been doing some quests up the north here. Uh, hired a few people, lost a few people, bought some trade goods, some lumber. Lumber is actually a good one if you see it for a cheap price just to pick it up. Just let it sit in your inventory. Because every once in a while you'll come to a town that's had you know, destruction and they'll pay very inflated prices for lumber. So you can make some easy money there. Uh, it's cheap to buy normally, 180 or less. So when you see it on sale or whatever, just pick some up, let it sit in your inventory. Um, for trade goods, if you're not aware... Uh, again, first of all, the bigger cities usually pay more for goods, and the farther you travel with it, the farther it is from where you purchased it, uh, as I understand, that also boosts the price a little bit. And I bought it way up, I don't know, here somewhere, Hoyland, I think. So, uh, decent amount of travel. It's a big city. Last time, although that was a while ago, it was down here, they had some damage from raiders, so I could get lucky and they could have uh, inflated prices. Anyway. On my way, I've got these seven nomad cutthroats in the way. Again, with some casualties and things, I'm not in the ideal situation to fight them. As I was coming down this road, I passed a group of mercenaries, the Oathbreakers or something. There's like seven of them. Those guys are, of course, really good. And this may be obvious, but for those to those of you who it isn't obvious to, uh, I might come to... You could try to dance around those guys and maneuver around, which is fine, but... In this case, I would like to kill them and maybe get their stuff. So, well, okay. So we'll come up here. We'll bait them. 
they'll come along and these they're gonna fight because those mercenaries will wreck <laughs> will wreck um, these guys slingers yeah now these are outlaws these are raider level guys there are nine of them no just five so if you've never fought with mercenaries mercenaries fought or for or against them mercenaries are very unusual they're right there it says mercenaries they could be guys in super heavy armor two-handed weapons they could be high level archers they could be lightly armored dudes with dogs and nets um and, and not the whole group just each individual in the group is going to be a a wild mix of all those types of things uh, occasionally at higher levels they'll have specific things that may say master archer a very high level archer or hedge knight who is a super heavily armored uh, usually with a two-handed weapon occasionally with a weapon and shield so uh, I think even with um, being outnumbered usually mercenaries uh, are pretty good unless unless these are crap again because it's random you could roll up uh, some pretty crappy ones we'll come in here one more time and just double check you can see I'm a bit reduced uh, but my guys have spears and shields which is probably for the best because spears give a bonus to hit I'm kind of tempted to try to put him on the front line as well with this shield and spear uh, just because I don't want to get outflanked by these guys although he doesn't have a good helmet for that and he is my most important, probably. Yeah, so we'll take that. We'll give it to him. We'll give this guy a spear. How did we lose? No, he's got the boar spear. We're going to give the boar spear to our best guy. Increase their chance of hitting something. All right. Uh, it's about the best we're going to do. It's as best as we can be prepared. I might he's hopefully not going to get in the melee but he may have a chance to hit somebody all right so we're close obviously these are uh, factions that are against each other so the nomads and the iron pact here should fight each other and you can see here's my standard and here's the standard for the iron pact so you know that the mercenaries are on our side and I thought the two raider groups would be together. They're not. You only see one flag, and it doesn't say anything about the uh, outlaws here. So this should be a quick and one-sided fight, but we'll let it play out just so you can see what mercenaries are, because as you progress, there may be quests or missions where you have to fight mercenaries, um, and if you don't know what they are, that uh, <laughs> you may not know what you're walking into. All right, so let's just look at what the mercenaries are. We've got a guy in eh, medium armor with a crossbow. We've got a guy in eh, heavy to medium armor, but no helmet really, and a longbow it looks like. And you can see it says nimble underneath his fatigue there. So he's got the nimble perk. This guy, like I said, they have nets a lot of the time. He's got pretty light armor, a decent helmet, a net and a arming sword, a you know high level sword. This guy's got medium armor and a two-handed lower level sword. Eh, medium armor and uh, you get the battle forged perk, so he's going to be difficult to kill. This guy doesn't have a helmet. He's battle forged. He's got just a spear and a shield. So, yeah, these guys up here, these guys uh, are like raider level, at least gear-wise, these two are. Now, their skills... And ability levels are usually pretty high so this should be a one-sided fight and we can wait because we have the ranged advantage oh, throwing weapons in fact that might be a good opportunity again you only get experience and loot for the things you kill so I will want to try to kill that guy. No one else is nearby, really. He's already gone. He's already moved. Well, he could move again, I suppose. So, I could... Yeah, let's go and try to kill him. I might be getting too greedy here, but... Yeah, see? Took my spot! So he's going to come up here. 
That's another thing. If you didn't notice, when you move up, sometimes when you get next to somebody and they become outnumbered, they'll take a, a morale check. And these guys both failed it, so now they've decreased to wavering. And if you haven't noticed, you can check when your people have little leadership or, or morale modifiers. It's just down here. You hover it over it because he's confident. He gets 10% to his offensive and defensive skills, which is pretty big. And then the same, the negative happens when they've got wavering or breaking stats. That's why morale is so important because these can stack really quickly. Uh, I could attack, I think, since they're probably going to go first next turn, it'll be better for me to defend. And then they'll attack. I'll be a little bit safer, hopefully. And then I can swing back. I was wanting to go in there with both my people, and they took it. So, I don't have any good shots. Everything's cluttered. Uh, you can, of course, just spray shots in and hope that you hit something. I didn't, but it's always an option. Um, he can come up here and defend. You can see, because they have high initiative, they're going to go first. And they're picking on my guy because he's weaker. And again, they usually go for the targets that are easier to hit. Now, uh, he's going to go in 13 turns. He's going to go in 10 turns. This guy's going to go in 8 turns. So I could swing and try to hit this guy. I'd hurt him if I did hit him. I wouldn't kill him, but I'd hurt him. And then this guy would attack and probably finish him off. So we'll wait. We'll let him go first, and my guys can try to pick up the pieces. And leadership and morale all over the place is dropping. Alright, so this guy is hurt now. We can try to finish him. Uh, we can try to hit this guy. You can see I'm not doing very much damage to these people. He's already gone. He's already gone. Done. I might only get one kill out of this, but that's something. Oh. Actually, there's another thing. So, it's too late now, but when you see... When someone's fleeing and there's people around him, when he steps away, everyone gets a swing at him, and if he gets hit, he doesn't get to move. So, if you don't know... The order is, if he's if you've got a person here running, if there's a person directly above him, that person swings first. And then it goes clockwise after that. So the person directly above, then the person in like the 2 o'clock position, then the 3 o'clock, then the 4 o'clock, then the 6 o'clock, and around. That's the order it goes in. So if you want to make sure you're the one who swings first and potentially gets the kill, you try to be towards the 12 o'clock position. And if you want the other people to swing first, maybe to damage him, uh, you'd want to be a little bit later. But again, every time, if he steps away and gets hit by the guy at the 12 o'clock position, he goes back, and if he tries again, the 12 o'clock position gets to swing first again, over and over again. So, you can see, uh, we only got a little bit of experience, because we only get experience from the person we kill, and the person who actually does the kill gets extra experience. So you can see he's got one kill. That's why he's got 54. Everybody else was just assisting with the kill. So then I get 24. Now, I don't know this part. We only get the gear off the guy who we killed. I don't know if this is like a fraction of what the unit as a whole had or if, if you get everything. But uh, these are all nice perks to get after the fact. So now... The question is, do we want to take on a few outlaws and a few slingers? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, because it says a few slingers, that means two to three. Slingers are pretty lame. <laughs> They're very lame. Uh, so if we're lucky, we can uh, easily gank an outlaw or two and maybe get some much better gear. Because those guys, again, they're like thug level, so we're not going to get as good gear from them. But let's make sure no one's too critically hurt. He's not critically hurt, but he's lost some armor. This guy's untouched, 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 untouched. So what we can do is swap armor out. I should just 
click. You right click and it will equip or unequip. So there you go. So now, again, the slingers are out there. I'm not too worried about them hitting us. Um, but now my guys in the front line are fully ready to go. He's only moderately scratched. Now, something else is interesting if you're unaware. I should probably give. I, put, I finally remember to put my bandages on people, so I got one on each. If we get into another fight, the iron pact here, those mercenaries we saw aren't going to be the same mercenaries. They're randomly generated. So it'll be the same number. It'll be eight, and I don't think they'll be injured. They'll be brand new. They're just going to be a whole new random lot. So we don't know exactly who we're going to get to fight with, but we'll take a look. Or they'll run, which I don't blame them. Now, after a fight, other units will pause for a second. So we move faster. So we might not be able to catch up. Oh, there's probably other enemy troops down there. They're like the uh, city guards. Okay, he's coming for us. And now we can go in. And we got both banners here. So let's do a twofer. Ah, this might be a different standard. So maybe there's two different raider groups. I hadn't looked at that at the time. but Yeah, so now that is a two-handed polearm, basically. That thing, well, it probably won't one-shot one of my people. It maybe could have hit him in the head. It's going to do a lot of damage regardless. So uh, that's the most dangerous weapon. That's a light mace. That's meh. That sword? That sword can do a lot of damage once your armor's broken. So i got to make sure that doesn't happen. On the other hand, I could just try to run down these slingers because they'll be easier to kill. At least I get some experience out of the fact. I don't want to run to here because then he could step back and just swing at me. He could take one step and swing. So I want to keep at least two steps distance. And in fact, see it says these guys have two turns. They haven't gone yet, so I may wait. Let them go. Uh, one, two, three, four. I don't want to go there. Let's go here. And this guy can go up. Nope, he can still get hit up there. That guy's going exactly where I wanted to go. I can shoot at him. That's the advantage of bows. They do have long range. No, we're not going to go over there. We could go up here, potentially. And they're running away. That's fine. We're running closer to this guy. Nets. <laughs> Nets are handy. Uh, you get a much higher chance to uh, hit your target when you've got one of those on them. Mercenaries have pretty high initiative. That's why they're going before me. I don't think there's a penalty to hit when you're in the net. You're just easier to hit when you're in the net. Um, and it might lower your, um, what's it called? Your initiative as well as your slower, but I can't remember for sure. I could go here and swing, but I don't think I want to do that. Now, if you are adjacent, right next to a polearm, they get a penalty to hit. So I could potentially go there. That guy's not hurt very much. Whatever. We're going to go for it. That's the worst that could happen. I think we know it's the worst that could happen. But why I can't hit him anymore? I don't want to go there. So let's come over to here. Uh -oh. <laughs> That's the problem. They'll uh, kill your stuff quickly. Now, he's scared. He's in the net. He's outnumbered. Hopefully, he will go to hit my guys. And if he does, he won't do a crap load of damage. Uh, we'll see. Okay, maybe we can hurt him? Nope. Maybe they'll hurt him and we can finish him? He's really hurt. He's running. 
Yeah, we killed him. So he might at least get that weapon. If he can get that polearm, that'll be a huge asset for us in future fights. It's devastating at this uh, at this level. He might get his armor too, although it's probably pretty beat up. It looked like it was pretty much broken helmet and. Uh, huh? Somebody leveled up. No one got hurt. We do get the pull mace, and we get some loot as well. So, um, get a look out for those opportunities and guide, either guide people in to help you with fights or guide the enemy in to help so you can get that done. Let's take a look at that pull mace. We'll just see exactly how massive a bonus that is. So, we'll compare it to the uh, war fork here. Where is it? All right. So, the war fork. In fact, again, we'll equip it. So you can actually see fully with all the bonuses and things uh, what the stats are. 40 to 60 damage to hit points and inflicts 40 to 60 damage to armor. Okay. Uh, 60 to 75 damage. So the other one's 40 to 60. So the maximum of the previous weapon is the minimum for this thing. 60 to 75 and it inflicts 72 to 90 damage of arm to armor as opposed to 40 to 60. 72 to 90. So, uh, well, so the maximum is 50% more. The minimum is almost twice as much. So the range is narrower and much higher. Now, the only downside, and there's a couple downsides, um, it's heavier, which again isn't a big problem right now. Uh, but as we start getting more armor, uh, you guys start making decisions like, yeah, how much, how much armor can my guy carry? Because I've got lots of armor now, and I don't want him too fatigued, so he's not going to be able to fight, or he'll he'll swing a couple times, and be out of breath. Usually not as big a problem with the back rank guys until you get abilities where you can swing like at multiple targets and things. So this thing weighs. 14 maximum fatigue and if you look on here it says the top line under the text description there six ap to use and builds up 15 fatigue so it takes 15 fatigue to swing this one it weighs 10 so it weighs four less it takes 15 to swing it takes six really same fatigue it's a uh, remarkable so ultimately the, the bottom line is this is a, a far superior weapon this thing's special ability this spear wall thing again some people like to use it against beasts maybe they just kind of rush in mindlessly uh, but ultimately this weapon's not that great you're not, certainly not going to use it at higher levels this thing you could use for quite a long time this ability um, you know sometimes it's nice to stun something or at least attempt to 75% and if you don't know the mace, whether it's the two-headed mace or the one-headed mace or whatever, it says as it'll star next to it, its special ability is to inflict 10 extra fatigue. That doesn't sound like a lot, and again, at these lower levels, it's not. But when you start fighting the tougher opponents that may take several turns to kill, and they may have very, very dangerous weapons and abilities, uh, the ability to beat them with these kind of weapons and fatigue them to the point very quickly where they can't use those special abilities and they can just do one basic attack uh, that's that can be pretty useful it's not something i usually focus on i, I like other things i don't like the stun fatigue game uh, but it is an option out there so i'm going to give this to someone who's probably got my best weapon skill and get to crushing some skulls and ultimately i think that brings us to about the hour mark so I think it's a good place to stop. We learned about backgrounds for characters, saw a couple tactical battles, how to uh, bait enemies into fights with allies where you can take advantage, and uh, it's a great way to get some, some easy loot sometimes, so keep an eye out for that. It can make the game a lot easier if you can... Even one or two items of good armor or good weapons... Um, that are one or two levels more powerful than your party as a whole, uh, suddenly 
this this club I got is going to become like a magical weapon for my party, crushing people left and right and making fights for the next several weeks in game uh, much easier. So uh, hopefully you learned something, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode.